going to speak step by step by to freedom with the sun. And so first we have to define what is freedom. We are, we are told, and Americans tell you, we are living in the world of freedom, but it's very relative. The freedom I mean is a very ideal freedom, which can only be produced if we are starting to cooperate with the sun, also with the political mission of the sun. Because the star has a political mission, which is at the same time a global mission. The global mission, I just repeat in short, I think we have one hour, hmm? so I, is the following, the natures, um, our natures, we must also say, there is a multitude of other natures in the universe, and we are speaking about our little sun and earth system, that's just an other thing. Our system is driven by a fixed star, which is a huge fusion reactor, the dream of physicists on Earth, a weird dream, because why should we develop something which exists already and has a time of test for a billion years and will live for a billion years more. The reason of the dream is uh, on Earth is the contrary of freedom, because it's a dream to hold in hand on a very, very small volume such huge amounts of energy that you will be eternally becoming rich as owner of this. And just the contrary is the sun. The sun holds so much more energy and brings it to the earth in photons. And these photons are cooperating in all phases while they are interacting with the nature. They are cooperating in a tender but intelligent way. All closed loops. Only Homo sapiens started to discover that products which are freely given from the sun, that's an inbuilt principle, the sun uh, is a free giver uh, with love to its creation. Uh, only when we started getting the dollars in our eyes or the euros and said, hey, I could sell these apples, I could sell this quantity produced, I could sell this oil, which is basically nothing else than the, a little end product of the clean sun. So we started the mess and we got directly into unfreedom. That's the situation. Secondly, we have a very strange uh, vision how to be happy. And I want to make a little graph. Because we are not speaking about quality of life, we are speaking purely about quantities. So the little graph shows the following. On this axis, I have the quantity of a given good. I will give you an example. And here I have the resulting quality of life for an individual or for a society. Let's start with food. If we have zero food, quality of life is zero. We are dead. <laughs> then, if we get, I speak now in kilocalories, if you are hard workers because you are going to build a permaculture, so you need 2,000 kilocalories. Huh? So I already make a distinction. If these are 2,000 kilocalories in this case, if you have junk food coming from McDonald's and others, um, our life quality will be here. And if we have perfect um, nourishment as we have it here, it will be here. So two passes. First, you can see that, hey, Wrong. We need to switch the axis. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> I took a little bit this morning. Okay, you switch the axis in your mind. <laughs> I saw it, okay. But you understand what I mean. <laughs> um, if you eat much more and switch always the axis here, yeah, 
Fred. We, the quality becomes at a certain moment zero. Meaning that if you go to the uh, fat Americans and the average and Germans are not much better, uh, they're going down until you are dead. You can take many other examples. If you say, I, want, I need a very fast car, and you go into the towns where about 40% of 50% of all the movements in a country take place and you say I need 100 kilowatt or 250 kilowatt Cayenne engine under one simple S and then you look how fast do you move from A to B and it's the average speed is under 30 kilometers and the quality of life becomes very bad the more cars you have and if you take a bicycle with 100 watts, you are not only more healthier, but you're also faster. So, I want to say that if we speak about a solar society, and if we apply, of course, in the right coordinate system, <laughs> the quantity and the quality, there are always points of optimum, and these points of optimum will be tendency always underrun by those people who want to sell us things we don't need. That is the principle of the market. So if you could also say, look at the products in the market, and I would guess that over 90% are simply not necessary, but with a good propaganda we need more and more. Okay, that's not what I mean with the sun. It's not an intelligent way. So now let's go a little bit more to the step-by-step -step approach. I hope that you all have been convinced uh, in the days you had been here that we have sitting a core element of a multifunctional solar system, which of course is still in its beginning stage, but we reached a stage that we can now say we are going to multiply it, we are going to bring it in villages, we are going to discuss how it is locally produced, possibly in the next step with local materials and so on. And this system can do, I just repeat it, produce around the clock. That's very necessary for the freedom. If you want to have freedom of energy, we cannot be dependent from other sources. We must have small let's say base power station. Base power means in terminus technicus 24 hour uh, per day running principally 365 days per year. So our system we have shown you and there will be others following and other intelligent or even more intelligent people will build better. So that is nature of the beast and must be like this. We, but we can already show we can produce around the clock in small, medium and later la larger scale electricity, mechanical work, cooling. Uh, we can cook around the clock with the sun with good comfort. And uh, what did I forget? Basic needs for first in mechanical. So we have a small uh, versatile power station. This can bring um, independence in energy, especially uh, if we coming now to a little bit economic terms must be applied. Of course, uh, we could build the storage always so that at every moment, and be, uh, be it a uh, very unpredictable weather pattern as we had it now here, it's unusual for Tamera, that we have the storage so big that in any case we always will have enough solar energy and then consequently we will enlarge as a collector to fill the storage but it becomes uneconomic and therefore it is wonderful that the sun gave us freely also the possibility to work with biogas. Of course biogas from a technical standpoint of view is much less effective in bringing heat into uh, um, into a cooking vessel. The reason is the following. The sun shines with one 
uh, kilowatt per square meter and this one kilowatt per square meter is transferred with about 500 watts now at the stage we are into cooking power. Uh, the sun shining on one square meter uh, of tree which oh, uh, biological system producing biomass uh, has not 50% efficiency, has about maximum half a percent of efficiency. So you can say, but the trees are growing by themselves, then it's clear, I'm not making a judgment, but I simply say, uh, for simple reasons of arithmetic, if you use sunshine, the bulk should come from the sun, and the edges where it becomes difficult, the system becomes too big, you complete, I gave this example with biogas, but of course can be done with a rocket stove, of course can be done uh, what we uh, dream since long of by reversible thermochemical reactions as a storage. So we have this. That's the first step. I already mentioned that, so we could say, Schematically, solar input in a black box, which is the system of our village or settlement. What we already can show, electricity around the clock, cooling around the clock, heat I symbolize for cooking, around the clock, Mechanical work around the clock, which is important. Uh, mechanical work, we gave examples in Africa, milling, saws, whatever, directly coupled to the engine. That's the advantage. Yeah. Now, this gives already a certain degree of freedom, because we are no longer obliged to buy from the central grid. So freedom is associated with no grid. Hmm? Little maybe modification uh, if some villages or settlements are forming a little micro system, then it may well be that we have a micro grid, which can be a very intelligent solution. But I am speaking about the big grid from the big power station owned by those people who take away our freedom because we give them our last sense to get the qualities I have designed. But then, what is the other trap we have? And you simply have to look into your wallet. What do you pay? One of the biggest traps uh, is the pharmaceutical medical industry, especially for people in the third world. So what we can add to this is the solar pharmacy. Plus, it's at the same time, a pharmaceutical uh, factory. Let me explain about this. If you look by near what the, the big companies uh, producing drugs, medicine are doing, first of all they look, got in the nature and looked what ingredients are in different plants. And the knowledge of shamans from a long time. Uh, I have seen so many of them. I have been uh, once in uh, North America, um, you know, sometimes with Indian tribes, and there's such a huge knowledge, which still is not completely huge. So, um, the basic is coming from the sun. The sun produced, through the wonder of nature, ingredients in plants which we can grow. So, concrete plan, we spoke about Israel. Uh, I told you that in the Arava Institute, I was since long time fascinated uh, by Ellen Soloway, which is a botanic uh, professor, well, worldwide renowned, and uh, what, all, all she did in her life was collecting in all deserts of the world uh, medical plants. 
little side remark. It is no, uh, not astonishing that especially in arid and semi-arid areas you find the best medical plants. The reason is the following, it has to do with radiation. Uh, you have very pure skies, you find this also in the higher mountains, and there you have more UV radiation. And the UV radiation is this part which produces qualities, also medical qualities mainly in the plants. So that's logic. But these plants are very sensible. They need a selective shadowing. Selective shadowing means when they come up as small plants and you, then you must protect them more against the sun. As, as they become bigger, they need a little bit more. And so Ellen um, worked this with her hands, putting over nets and studying how the grow rate is in function of the irradiation. And when she came in contact uh, with our concept uh, of the greenhouse technology, I remember you that we have, I spoke yesterday about this filter roof which can control exactly the amount um, of light coming to the plants. Hmm? That is the ideal um, situation to grow medical plants. And then, if you have grown medical plants, you are going to process them. You need distillation, you need grinding, you need mechanically quenching them to make syrups or whatever. And that's the charm of this design, that this filter house is with the system we have here, already creating all these qualities, including deep freezing. So it's very logic that we have the program, that's the next step, to add to our freedom uh, the solar pharmacy. Okay, now we say by this way, principally we can become independent from these burdens. But we have other requirements, which up so far are only feasible in large factories. That's at least what they claim. And I think when we spoke yesterday about the fire, that was good. Who, who said this with the fire from the group? Andrew. Andrew, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good picture. Huh? Started with the fire in the cave, and then when we discovered that we burn. Uh, coal or other fuel started with big factories and one go once in a big Thyssen uh, factory in Germany and see how, or in other countries, how steel comes out in tons of blocks, red glowing, 1200 degree and then being uh, handled to materials which we have in all our uh, daily needs. So. Uh, People tend to say, hey, yes, it must be so big, because uh, such a big steel block, that's true. But this big steel blo block, after being treated, is dissipated to many, many, many people. So the question is, can we have a small steel block producing enough of molten steel, other stuff, in a village environment? And there, again, just pointing out the basic physics, uh, the sun has a surface temperature of over 500 de uh, 5,000 uh, degrees centigrade. Um, if we are entering in an exchange, optical exchange of the sun, let's say with our fixed focus mirror, or another good mirror, um, we are producing a small image of the sun and depending from this angle, the image sees the mirror. The mirror becomes, for the focal point, the sun. So if we would travel, I gave this examples, I just said you can a little bit have it in your understand what, why optic fun functions. If we would travel with a rocket to the surface of the sun, at the beginning, we see it only at a small angle of half a degree, and then it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and we burn. Chuck! If we are on the surface, 
it's 180 degrees and we are 5000 degree hot. So if we produce an optic with a very short, that was what you also explained, hmm, with a very short focal length, see if this focal length would be here, the angle of view is smaller as if we see it here. Hmm? So we can approach uh, the 180 degree condition and if then the optical surface of the mirror are good, we principally get the same temperature as the surface of the sun, which is not possible and which is not necessary. So <laughs> what we tended to do is to produce uh, this precision um, for our conditions optic, lightweight, which is capable to work in the, typically in a temperature range between 300 and 1500 degrees centigrade. So what this has to do now uh, with um, having a little metal plant. Hmm? So of course melting points of metals, different materials around 1000 degrees. Uh, so it is important from a pragmatic standpoint of view, and I want to point this out, that the optic we developed has a fixed focal point. That's not so logic. Huh? Normally you say, okay, the sun moves uh, over the sky, my mirror must move with it, and then the classical round parabolic mirror is producing a wandering hotspot. It's enough difficult uh, to imagine a little steel plant or a melting plant, <laughs> you always have to track with the hotspot. So this is a very good um, possibility, high concentration. I, I don't have to repeat what Douglas and Daniel and um, my dear friends already explained. We go in a cavity. In this cavity, uh, imagine this, uh, this cavity can be opened, I make only simple model now, and inside we have now stacks, we can bring in uh, materials we want to melt, we have pots to receive the molten materials, then we already have a first stage of a, of a metal processing plant. We can also melt together in the hotspot directly different materials, even in a better way as we do it now, uh, and one, uh, now uh, you are going with electric resistance ovens which cost the hell of energy if you want to have clean energy and uh, the sun by itself is completely clean, the photons are not dirty, that's a good thing. So we can add to the complexity little power plants and of course we are not limited to metal melting. We can add uh, ceramics, we spoke about this. We can, um, give me some examples. Glass. Glass. Glass, yeah, glass, glass production. That's a wonderful possibility, you know, if, if in a further stage you say, hey, but our, we don't want from Saint-Gobain to, to buy glass, hmm? we want to produce ourselves, you will be able to do it. And it's, it, it's not uh, utopic, go, go in the history, uh, 2,500 years ago or 3,000 in Babylonia, uh, they already produced a local stage glass. So this is feasible. You can also produce uh, this super film uh, of fluor polymer if you have Flussspat, I don't know this in, in English, it's a mineral. Yeah. Uh -huh. Fluor spot, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can do this. Uh, well, another degree of freedom producing materials. Um, you can do also other things in the concentrated light. Not only in the concentrated, but in the concentrated, you can do it with even more effect. Cleaning of infected water. I am now not speaking about DDT because this is unfortunately one of the real big sins of humanity to bring such super poisons 
in, uh, in the nature and it is simply criminal just to re say it that we in the rich nations we understood we shouldn't do this and at the same moment we undergo the laws and we give it to the poor people who, who have no way to defend themselves at the moment. This is a shame. One of the reasons we must become free, freedom from them. Uh, speaking about water cleaning, the well, first simple thing, if you have, a, if I would have not uh, drank in water I shouldn't have, I wouldn't have DRR at the moment. Huh? So this is one of the illnesses which happen very often in Africa and other countries. It's one of the main reasons that uh, babies are dying by dehydration. India it's the same. Well, the very simple thing, uh, if you want uh, to clean water, uh, for, for example also from cholera bacteria, mm -hmm. uh, you take a bag of our material, of this plastic material, so of this material. I don't say our material because I want to make money with it, because it has a characteristic. This material, if I design again the solar spectrum here, this about 3 to 4 percent of UV radiation are not going, if I make, if I bring here the transmissivity of a material, if we take glass, it's evidently very transparent to the visible, this is the visible range and this is the infrared range, all, both associated with energy. But the window is no longer transmissive in the UV range. So if we would build a bag with infected water and put it in the sun, and if it would be built out of glass, nothing would happen. It would simply heat the water. But if we build it out of the fluor polymer material, it is transparent to UV. So if you count the population, let's say, of coli bacteria, which is very high at the beginning when you take it out, and you have here your hours, and a typical sunny day, a quantity, of course, which has to be defined, so which is by square meter about 30 liters, square meter. You will observe that the population is nearly zero. And if you have, uh, it's for sunny condition, if you have some clouds, take some longer. Therefore, it was important that someone invented a little sensor which is counting the bacteria in a, in a simple way. Uh, so you can control with such bag type, uh, clean the water. So, but now if we have the mirror, just to give you an example which really functions, uh, the mirror is also reflecting the UV part. Only if we coat it with uh, aluminium. If it would be coated with silver, it would reflect 3% more, but we would have no, uh, for energetic purpose better, but not for, for photo effects. So we have concentrated UV light here, and if something is concentrated, uh, it has more effect, in most cases. So what we designed long time ago with Ben Gurion University in Israel was a vessel which is filled with the water to be cleaned with a quartz window because quartz is transparent to the UV radiation and resistant to the high radiation. But we need only this part of the spectrum. So what we put in here 
is a filter. This filter lets through only the UV part and the other part is reflected. So we create a second hotspot. This is the first. The first hotspot is a UV hotspot and it works wonderfully. And the second hotspot has a lot of energy. With this you can again do everything I explained to you before. Oh, it's a multifunction system, typical example uh, what can be done. Or we come with some novel, very exciting developments taking place in photochemistry. Uh, when, you, when you put into this water, I go just back to this, when you insert um, a little bit of titanium dioxide powder, <coughs> plenty available in the world in all colors, hmm? um, then you will observe that you get much faster cleaned water. And you even get then killed to absolutely zero. This is a photo induced effect when on the titanium dioxide particles uh, light is irradiated you are creating free OH groups and these free OH groups hydroxide group are, are destroying every organic bacterium it's a wonderful uh, chemical uh, free uh, physical process and one of our partners, we are also working in a network from Max Planck Institute, Martin Demut, uh, he looked uh, uh, more near uh, to this photocatalyst. The first thing uh, you observe, this is white, it's not good. If you have a white powder, you bring it in the sun, most of the energy is reflected. So he looked for novel types of darker, if not black semiconductors, silicon alloys, uh, having the same effect. And he found them. And then they are much better. And then he found, uh, and we, Olivier, had you been there when we produced the first hydrogen and oxygen? Hmm? Then we found that the same semiconductors, you bring them, again, fix focus mirror, what we did, we had uh, water and in the water we put a sus suspension so we had a little swirl here so that suspension of this powder was in the water and illuminating it and we discovered We have H2O here inside, setting free of hydrogen. So we split water, evidently, uh, hydrogen comes out. But what happened with the oxygen? So we said maybe it's not really splitting water, maybe it's a so-called sacrificial uh, effect by destroying uh, the material. Huh? Uh, but then, discovered that the oxygen is wrapping in a picture like giant uh, long spaghetti, of course nano spaghetti, uh, around, around this catalyst cones. And <laughs> how could we get it free? One could get it free, so during, first the system was good, it's splitting and separating. In normal uh, electrolyzers you need separation membranes and here it's done with another physical effect. The oxygen stays wrapped ar <laughs> uh, around the catalyst parts. And, but how to get them out from there? We also want to have the oxygen. So what was found in lab at this stage is if you heat it up uh, for a small moment in night time 
uh, this mixture with the wrapped around oxygen, then the oxygen came out like an avalanche. Boom! And uh, you needed only a little trigger energy, then it was an exothermal process. Hell of heat coming out and pressure. So one of the dreams of rocket engineers to build a new uh, propulsion medium. So uh, this material worked well. Um, the, it was internationally re recognized, uh, the, but it was unstable. It started oxidizing, rusting, and so the next step was done in the years to come and now there is a complete unoxidable material. And I want to close it here to say only this material is content in most of the sand around uh, in Africa and other countries. And to process it, to bring it to the stage, to become such a catalyst, we need again precise heating at given temperatures and we need at the same time when we have melt up uh, the substance what is called quenching in technology. We have to cool it in a very short fraction but controlled uh, to a certain temperature then the crystal structures form exactly as you want. And this is of course not uh, the next step which can be done, but I explain why I'm talking about this. So I gave you some examples here, how step by step, only with two instruments here, and in your fantasy, please add many others, because there are many other instruments, but all decentral, all working with this free energy of the sun, directly or indirectly. And what I wanted to say, to bring it back here. We get for our material needs more and more freedom. And we said freeing people. But this is not the whole story. Because only when we are set free, so when we don't have to uh, sorrow how to feed our family, when we don't have sorrow if our children are dying and we have nothing to do. We have, it's given from the sun. And our knowledge uh, is transforming it. By the way, I named this the first law of global politeness. Why? Because if you see it as this, it's a gift. The sun, with its electromagnetic radiation in a bright spectrum and in such a huge amount coming on Earth is a gift. We also got, got a gift, many gifts, but one gift is that we can think about it. And uh, up so far in the generations before, knowledge was always associated with power. The moment you have knowledge, you have power, you dominate the other. But knowledge, of course it's power, but it's misuse to use it as power. It's against the central photon law. I once said, for me, the photons are enwrapped by an invisible field of direction, of love, of compassion. And if we are not going exactly in this way, we are failing. Now, why first law of politeness? If I come to you and you offer me a wonderful basket of fruits hmm, as my guest, and I am going and say, I pick one out, the rest I throw away. You would be pissed about me. I hope so. <laughs> I'm very unpolite. And that we are so unpolite in our utilization of what the nature gives us, so you can say, okay, we don't know. In this case, it is already written in the Bible, uh, God forgives them because they don't know. But today, we have to write, uh, God forgives them not 
because they don't do what they know. It's a very big difference. <laughs> and for me, this is in the political sense, in the philosophy of a decentral, it's not only talking, it's really a core element of, of thinking. Hmm? Okay, so, said, we can feel, we can see, we can get uh, this freedom for our material needs, and I say at the same moment, it will be better than all what industry has produced up so far. Because the tools we are working with are nano-scaled photons, and the more we know, the, f f the more fantastic things we can do. We can use it in art, we can put light in. So one of my favorite points will be to bring in, finally, um, invention I just made by accident, you could say, so long time ago, I had one idea, uh, was to store light. Hmm? It's a, so it's a, we already had in Germany prominent people called the Schildbürger, you know, <laughs> there are people who forgot, uh, they built the house, uh, the communal house, they forgot <coughs> to build the windows, and so they came to the uh, genius idea to go out with bags and pull the light and bring it in. Didn't function, but only because they didn't close enough fast the bags and the material was wrong. So um, what, what I saw is uh, you have uh, phosphorus and colors, you know them all. Not radioactive natural phosphorescence colors who are emitting light they have absorbed long before. So the idea was, uh, could I bring uh, these um, color particles into a liquid, transparent liquid form, uh, which we found? So it can be pumped now. You can imagine now you can have large surfaces like windows. You pump this liquid, it sucks in light, then you can bring it in a storage where you have a lo lot of volume and when you want to illuminate this room, it's not nice. Look in this, look in this <coughs> bulb, it's too intense. Huh? So I would now like to have um, transparent walls and I let flow through with lower intensity. It's a little bit analog on to the low temperature heating in that high and I will have all the photons I need. So having done this, it looks good, but uh, it, you look always a little bit like seasick because uh, most of those colors are in the green, in the optimum. <laughs> but you know, uh, since we have white diodes and playing around with phosphorescence and putting on a green emitter a fluorescence dye, I spoke about this for the plants, uh, which is transforming then uh, into uh, the next color in red and then mixing the colors you can get white. So this is feasible. But this was not the real discovery. Then I said, okay, one day uh, when Kamaling honors him, you may have heard her from uh, super conductivity. Uh, he simply knew one thing from physics, that if you are cooling down to absolute zeros, minus 273 degree, uh, a substance, uh, there will be no longer light emission because only the molecules are in their gitter are a little bit oscillating. And he had correlated this with the idea of, uh, of conductivity for electricity. So he played around and he found uh, materials uh, which were not at minus 273 degrees higher, 10 degrees higher, or 20, and suddenly you had superconductivity and, and time being, still the process is not completely understood, many theories, and one tries with semiconductors uh, to go to ambient temperatures, which would be a big advantage because we are losing, uh, for the big power stations at least, you are losing so many percent, about 20 to 30 percent in the land power lines. So my idea was I couldn't I fool around a little bit with this glowing light and freeze it. 
<laughs> that was so nice. Uh, in one configuration, and okay, for the next seminar, I promise, I bring this with me. You take this, you bring it in the ice box, and suddenly it stops glowing at minus five degrees centigrade. But the question was, did we destroy the light, or could we let this ice in the fridge, let's say for one month, for two months, for one year, and if we take it out, would it restart glowing? And the second is true. So we had <laughs> discovered a basic method how to store light in a cold store. I'm not, this is pleasure, and I'm telling this for one reason, this is, uh, to, to come to the next step of freedom. As far as I understand the creation, this is my personal opinion. Everybody can have a little slightly different or much more different. We, this story of having been expulsed from the paradise hmm, has nothing to do with an apple and with Eva. I don't believe it. I think, for me, the expulsion of the paradise was the moment we got dollar signs in our eyes. Because before, the tribal uh, societies were in closed loops. For sure, not at the level of uh, materials, they don't, simply didn't need it. Huh? But now we, in our world, uh, somewhat progress, we have more needs. So, if we get again out of our eyes the greediness, I mean 100% out, it's not functioning 95%, even not 99.9%. It's like the universe. Very strange things if you observe the universe. The natural constants of the universe, gravitation constant, uh, the interacting forces between matter, strong and weak forces, fields, speeds of light and all this are parameters. If those parameters are only fractions, fractions, fractions of a percent other, we would not live. The universe developed out of nothing with a set of parameters which must be 100% uh, maintained, if not the system is not stable. It will live for a certain moment, but then boom, it's finished. And I, I feel that we have the same situation here. Uh, it is not a game to say, yes, it's already good, we are 70% self-sufficient. Of course, on the way to self-sufficiency, we will start with zero and then five and ten, but we must reach the hundred. So, coming back to the story of discoveries and pleasure. If we have reached by material independence, our freedom. Now we suddenly have our brain, our fantasy, our talents. And this is the second revolution of freedom because it's my conviction that individuals by the creation are not created like clones. Huh? That would be if we are completely identical, it would be a boring world. It's so fantastic, everyone has a little bit another aspect to play in the field of opportunities given by the world. And this is intellectual freedom. This is the highest pleasure for human beings, having safety in their material needs and now starting to become really people who start to become real creators. Because before, we had been creators driven uh, by situations we needed, urgent situations. But free-floating insecurity, that is what the nature meant in evolution. And this is why we have to go to the solar photon age. And if we are there, you will see not all. Then, so many will play around 
not with colors, with other things, with arts, with a new type of philosophy, with new ways to explain, with poems. Uh, some will lay the whole day in the sun, also nice. Because <laughs> the possibility is there. Hmm? And that, I mean, is a utopic still, but reachable uh, liberation of mankind comes a point of justice. When the greediness appeared stronger and stronger in the eyes, mainly of Western world, could have happened in Africa, could have been the uh, opposite. But the circumstances brought in this period of our history that the technical knowledge uh, to build strong machines, also war machines, war, was in our fields. And therefore, because we were greedy, we started exploiting 100% the natural resources which are in the large world. By doing this, it's a perfect example if we speak here about DDT. I know the people who are, who are responsible for this. I know them. They are sitting in Switzerland, they are billionaires, uh, they are collectioners of art. From time to time they give a little piece of charity, but if they really look in the mirror they know uh, they have done so much more uh, misery. Hmm? So, it's not only this family in Switzerland, there are many in Germany, many in America, many in all over the, uh, this world. So we have uh, brought the death equilibrium in our world. And now we say, since we are very successful in placing satellites in the sky, and we say the first need of Africa is to get connected to satellite television and internet. Tell you, I, I, it's not cynical. I have been in Mali in a, in a conference, and we had a wonderful conference just speaking about those things. And there's only one plane going back, at least at this time, to Paris per week. For me, it was urgent to go back. I was already going in the plan. Then came a bunch of European, American, they held also a conference <coughs> about the internet. And because they were much more important than we, we were thrown out of the plane and had to wait another week. Because they told us, I had a little discussion uh, with one of them. Nice guy, I said, but do, do you really believe that this is the most important? That uh, the African woman must see uh, what is in Germany in a supermarket to, uh, to buy? Huh? Oh, he said, yes, it's very important. I said, uh, but would you give her the money then to buy it? Huh? It's a very strange world. Okay, having said this, I don't have to continue. You understand what I mean. Now comes the justice. We have built so massive infrastructures of energy. And we have so strong people who the hell don't want autonomy of people, because they are like, the industries in this sense are like the Scheinriesen of Michael Ende. There's a story for Ch Child, but it's very good for us too. So the Momo, who is an African, little African boy, driving with a locomotive through a wonderland, he sees huge, giant, terrific as big as a mountain. But then he observes, the nearer he comes to this giant, he shrinks. And this picture, please take for us as clients and this big, uh, this big uh, industries. They are only big because we pay them to, pay, uh, to, uh, to buy their stuff. If we are independent, they will shrink like the shinries of Mom. And that was said also yesterday, if you want to fight really against DDT and other industries, we should uh, not buy it, but unfortunately not we are buying it, but others who are corrupt. Okay, so, but the point was another one. 
having not the obstacles of a nuclear industry restarting to sell nuclear power plants uh, to Turkey where you have earthquakes. It's wonderful, intelligent. But a lot of money for Mr. Putin in this case. Or the, or the French, they sold just four nuclear reactors to England and uh, there were enough, really they had a chutzpah to say, uh, but we have only chance in uh, nuclear energy if we get like this renewable uh, fancy people, they get, uh, they get state subvention, so we are also renewable and they, they could get this. So you make the calculation, the moment this nuclear power stations will operate in 2025, the first in England, the real production cost will be about double as high as the photo photovoltaic electricity we have today. But the subvention they got is not only higher than uh, for, for the solar energy, but also longer. So you ask yourself, we are speaking about corruption in African countries and politicians corrupt, uh, which is true, unfortunately. But ours too, they only smile more clean, it's all dirty. Huh. So, but you don't have in the under, let's say in the pace of development, these obstacles, because there's no infrastructure. So you can build much faster. You can go in if there are not criminal actions who want to defend it. This is another point, but from the system side. Therefore, again, this term of justice for me is that at the end, the nations having the most of sunshine and having the lowest infrastructure now, by doing it right, will be the one who are pulling out the mankind of misery. And I, we can only hope that if these nations will act, as we said, in a cooperative model, they will not go and start redominating because they are now the stronger. Uh, the other parts of the world, this would be the ping pong game we play now. They can just stop it and come back. So my dream is, for example, uh, if we uh, produce in Africa engines, wouldn't it be nice if they come uh, to Greece and uh, you show solidarity and you show to the arrogant German eco-fascism, not ecological, I mean economic fascism, <laughs> uh, how they have no longer strength, how they shrink like the shine reason. So this is for me also a target and we can reach it if we are building up this network. So, and, and again, we, are, we must be really without compromise, not in the technology, so we have all possibilities. It might well be, uh, you know, we start with this, but we start at least, and it's important to start. And then, uh, 20 years, it will be a museum, and, uh, and kids from Africa, from India, from uh, uh, Aborigines will have brought systems with their internal knowledge. We will get out of the information age with, with electromagnetic artificial waves. They will teach us how we are communicating, how they do it now. And it will be more feasible because the accompanying noise in our world, all the subtle things are just under immense noise. Technically speaking, you know, if you, how could you hear your inner voice if you are in a metropole with uh, noise of the traffic and you have all these airplanes going over you, you will not find it. And this age is, and with this I end this vision, if you want, coming back to the nature, comparing the wonder of the technical natural systems. They are super technology, as we know. 
They are not only super technical because they are much more efficient and much more correlated, they are also beautiful. I have never heard a tree producing a terrible noise as a jet or something like this. And also not the birds flying or singing. So this is a part where there's a development of the technology from now. Okay, I, I see our engine still makes noise <laughs> and it looks too technical. In two generations it will look like an art piece. It will look like a flower. The concentrator will be inbuilt like an organic part of the system. And then we start thinking, and then starts the third evolution of mankind in the solar age. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you.